Hi, I'm Nafisa Latic and this is Across the Balkans. Today, Europe's far right joins Russia and China in endorsing Serb separatism in Bosnia at the time of the country's biggest crisis since the end of the war. Bosnian Serbs in Banja Luka are marking 30 years since they proclaimed their own entity, Republika Srpska. But Bosnia's Constitutional Court has declared their January 9th Statehood Day illegal as it discriminates against the region's Catholic Croats and Muslim Bosniaks. For them, the day feels like a celebration of the ethnic cleansing and genocide that soon followed its declaration. The weekend also saw incidents across Bosnia, with gunfire going off near mosques during prayers and public praise for convicted war criminals. Semir Sejfovic reports from Banja Luka. It looks like National Day celebrations you would see in many parts of the world, except this one is illegal. Bosnia and Herzegovina's top court has twice ruled that the Serb-dominated entity's so-called statehood day violates the constitution, but that does not seem to bother the Serbs celebrating here today. The parade features hundreds of officers from the militarized police force, the event is supposed to depict the might of what in reality is a cash-strapped entity of Republika Srpska, led by Bosnian Serb President Milorad Dodik, who was just sanctioned by the US Treasury Department. He's been pushing to break this region away from the rest of Bosnia. <laughs> The night before the parade, Dodik was endorsed by a collection of like-minded friends and allies. Among the VIP attendees are the Russian ambassador, members of Marine Le Pen's far-right national rally party from France, top officials of the Serbian government and the Serbian Orthodox Church. The date is so controversial because it marks the day when Serb nationalists proclaimed their own republic just before the outset of the Bosnian War, a war which saw Serb forces commit atrocities against Croats and Bosniaks. Serbian Prime Minister Anna Brnabic also addressed the gathering in Banja Luka. Republika Srbija nikada, nikada neće sprovoditi sankcije protiv pripadnika svog naroda i predstavnika srpskog naroda u Bosni i Hercegovini i Republici Srpskoj. It's clear that Milorad Dodik enjoys the support of the Serbian government in Bosnia's entity Republika Srpska. And according to him, the international community is conspiring against the Serb people. Danas ovdje otvoreno moram da kažem da svih ovih godina protiv Republike Srpske na muslimanskoj strani su radile Sjedinje američke države, da je radila da je radila Velika Britanija, značajni dio Evropske unije. Elsewhere, alleged Dodik supporters attacked and shot at a mosque in the town of Janja. Police in Brčko district also had their hands full, while across the border in Serbia's Priboj and Novi Pazar, there were threats of ethnic violence. The crowds start gathering at the parade, for some a provocation, for others a family event. I am the first member of the police of the Republic of Serbia. I am here today to talk about this and it's good. This is our day. The police of the Republic of Serbia has created this country, the army and the army, so it's all together. Today is great. I want to say that I want to say that I want to say that until I am alive, we will try to be all together in one country. Six or seven million soldiers, while the parade was in full swing in Banja Luka, in Bosnia's capital Sarajevo, which was besieged for three years by Republika Srpska's army, a 500-meter-long flag 
was spread through the streets. Svaki godni nešto novo, pa je ova današnja najduža zastava pokazuje koliko volimo Republiku Srpsku. Many Bosnian Serb leaders who declared Republika Srpska on January 9, 1992, ended up being convicted as war criminals at The Hague. Today's leadership glorifies them and rejects those verdicts, leaving many wondering if the leaders of today want to continue where their predecessors left off. Vojin Mijatović, the leader of the Social Democratic Party in Banja Luka and Dodik's opposition says the division is evident when verdicts and rule of law are failed to be implemented. Unfortunately, yes. Still we are living in this kind of condition in this country and unfortunately still in this country we have more than 45 constitutional court decisions which are not implemented. And one of these is this one concerning the constitutional day, uh, National Day of Republic of Srpska. Unfortunately in Bosnia and Herzegovina, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, obviously in Serbia, we have ethno-national leaders who are ready uh, to start again the, 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 the war in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the whole Western Balkans in a way to cover the uh, more than three, uh, three decades of uh, criminal activities in, uh, in, in, in their own countries. More than one-third of the population of Srpska has left Bosnia and Herzegovina due to a lack of opportunity. The average salary in Republika Srpska is around $450 per month. Sajan Puhalo, a political analyst, believes there won't be a new conflict, but a status quo, which Dodik narrates. Da rata neće biti. Ono čega se ja plašim što se tiče Bosne i Hercegovine je prosto to iznurivanje na koje čini mi se igra prije svega Republika Srpska, odnosno vlast u Republici Srpskoj Milora Dodik, a to znači da prosto obesmislite toliko tu državu i njene institucije da u jednom trenutku svi dignu ruke od nje i kažu pa... Fakat ne može da funkcioniše, fakat to je nemoguća država, ajde da rješavamo ono što je realno i što je moguće. Parades like this one and narratives promoted here are undermining Bosnia's institutions, sovereignty and territorial integrity, worsening a crisis created largely by Milorad Dodik, a man who swore an oath to protect those institutions. Semir Sejfović, TRT World. Banja Luka, Bosnia. My guest today is Marko Attila Hoare, who is a Balkan historian and associate professor at Sarajevo School of Science and Technology. He is in London for us. Uh, Marko, good to have you on the show. Uh, the recent days were extremely difficult for the Bosniaks living in Republika Srpska. How would you describe the incidents we've seen in Prijedor, in Janja, in Srebrenica, in Zvornik, in Foča, Banja Luka, and across the border in Serbia, in Novi Pazar, where mostly Bosniaks live? So, um... These are provocative events which aim to celebrate the 9th of January anniversary of um, the foundation of Republika Srpska, which was created through genocide. So uh, when this entity was established in 1990, uh, it was a step in the way on the road to genocide of, of the Bosniak. And although the Constitutional Court in Bosnia-Herzegovina has declared uh, this celebration illegal, uh, the regime of Milorad Dodik in Republika Srpska uh, goes ahead with it as a way of... Um, kind of engaging what it sees in what it sees as a state building project and also whipping up kind of nationalist passions as a part of its drive for secession. Um, so it involves very aggressive nationalist mobilization, uh, which can only be threatening to Bosniaks who experience genocide and for whom this day is associated, uh, this anniversary is associated uh, with that genocide. Um, so it's nationalist mobilization at the expense of Bosniaks and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Right, people are feeling uh, threatened, jeopardized. I mean, they are used to these kind of incidents. This is not the first time we are seeing this, especially around the 9th of January, as we both know and follow. Now, with the illegal celebrations and parade being held despite the ban and the U.S. sanctions uh, imposed on Milorad Dodik, um, is this his way of testing the waters in case he goes ahead with his plans? Yes, absolutely. So he's a very 
cautious politician, and his um, project, his long term, is the secession of Republika Srpska to create an independent state and the dissolution of Bosnia Herzegovina. So he takes these gradual steps and he tests the water to see if the um, international community will, will react to stop him. And when he kind of encounters resistance, he re retreats a bit. But it doesn't alter his long his long term goal. And we have seen um, increasing confidence on Dodik's part in, in, in recent months. Um, as he aims to bring about about this, this session. So it, because he is not encountering any serious resistance from the international community, he feels emboldened to go ahead with it. Right, and we witnessed once again a strong ties Dodik has with the far-right Euro politicians, known for their hostility towards Muslims, from Austria's Freedom Party uh, to France's Marine Le Pen Party. Now, uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban also announced Hungary will block any moves by Brussels to sanction Dodik. Uh, we know he's providing $100 million in aid to the Bosnian Serb entity. It's not lo looking great for the Bosniaks, uh, isn't it? Uh, can we expect a stronger reaction from Brussels, and will they finally step in and protect uh, Bosnia's sovereignty? Well, we can certainly hope for a stronger response uh, from, from Brussels, because this is a provocation that threatens to seriously disrupt um, the regions and Europe's stability. Um, the creation of a independent Republic of Srpska would be a grave affront and, and challenge to liberal democratic institutions uh, across the continent, and um, to the whole liberal democratic order. Uh, the trouble is we cannot expect such a stronger response um, because key European Union states like Germany and France have been building their policy in recent years on kind of accommodation of Russia and modus vivendi with Putin's regime. And Putin is, of course, backing uh, Dodik's secessionism and indeed backing it for the sake of, of causing this, this, this disruption. Um, furthermore, these politicians uh, across, across uh, Europe, um, even the mainstream ones like Emmanuel Macron in France, um, are competing with um, this, precisely these far-right populist Islamophobic uh, uh, domestic opponents. And so they have to compete on Islamophobic grounds. And so you've seen in France um, Macron making concessions to Islamophobic sentiment. Um, and, and finally, you have this um, the fact that some of these member states of the European Union are themselves headed by such right-wing populist um, anti-Muslim governments, such as by... Janusz Janša in Slovenia and Viktor Orban in, in Hungary. So there's a very strong constituency in the European Union against any tough action to stop Dodic secessionism. So in these circumstances, um, there's great pressures uh, on the European Union not to take action to stop this crisis developing. Right. Um, so how serious is the position that Bosniaks are in at the moment? Uh, how should they behave moving forward? How do you assess their response to everything that was happening with uh, the calls of Greater Serbia? And as of recently, also Greater Croatia, uh, we see these ideas are very much alive and gaining more and more support, unfortunately. Bosniaks are in a very serious situation because um, it can very, very easily happen that Republic of Srpska secedes in the near future. And if that happens, we'll probably have a parallel Bosnian Croat um, session from the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which would be very messy for the intermingling of Croats and Bosnia in the Federation. So it's a very serious situation that Bosniaks are faced with. And if this takes place um, and there is no response to it, then Bosniaks will be stuck in a kind of Bantustan or ghetto in the middle of uh, Bosnia as a governor covering perhaps um, 25 or 30 percent of, of the country. And um, um, they will also be faced with persecution in uh, Serbian Croat held, held areas, perhaps even a repeat of some of the uh, genocidal persecution that we witnessed in the, in the 1990s. So Bosniaks really need to be preparing to defend themselves, taking action um, to defend themselves from this, po this possible partition. A scenario, which means a military response to potential petrol, a potential Republic of Srpska secession, and also lobbying very hard for action on the part of the allies, the United States, Britain, European Union, um, to uh, put a stop to this. So they, they, they cannot rely on the international community, but they have to try and get the international community to, to wake up to see what's, um, see the danger that faces them and faces the entire region. Uh, and how to do that? What needs to happen for the international community to take the situation in Bosnia seriously? Marco, just briefly, I want to ask you that at the end. Um, well, I, I hope that the lobbying will be successful uh, and that um, Bosnia's friends and all supporters of liberal democratic values will, will wake up and see this, um, this um, threat and, and, and stop to it. Um, but it may be that you need a constant kind of explosion to happen before the, the West will wake up and uh, take action. So maybe... Um, if 
Noddy pushes himself too far, takes over plays his hand, that you'll finally see a reaction uh, to what to what he is doing um, on the, the rest part. Uh, that's what we can hope. Marco Attila Hoare, thanks so much for being a guest and for your insight and thoughts for us here on Across the Balkans. Now let's turn our focus to another incident that has caused controversy and attracted everyone's attention. The world's top-ranked tennis player, Serbian Novak Djokovic, won his appeal against the cancellation of his visa days after he was denied entry into Melbourne to compete at the Australian Open. His vaccination exemption, which was a recent COVID-19 infection, wasn't initially accepted. For anti-vaxxers and COVID skeptics, Djokovic has become a hero. But to many, his actions provoked outrage when it seemed like there were different rules for different people, especially at a time when countries are trying to boost vaccination rates amid new waves of infection. On Monday, an Australian court ordered Djokovic to be released from immigration detention, saying the government's reasoning for revoking his visa was unreasonable. Well, Djokovic tweeted that he is pleased and grateful that the judge overturned his visa cancellation. Despite all that has happened, he wants to stay and try to compete at the Australian Open. He says he remains focused on that. He flew there to play at one of the most important events we have in front of the amazing fans. While Australia's immigration minister says he reserves the right to revoke Djokovic's visa at any time, the Serbian players' supporters celebrated both in Melbourne and in Belgrade. I would like to thank the Australian government for creating a global hero in Novak Djokovic. So thank you. It backfired, didn't it? Shame on them. They are probably bothered Djokovic will win for the 10th time and that some Serb from small Serbia comes there to win the Australian Open for the 10th time. All of this will give him extra strength. They don't realize what they've done. He will now win 10 more Grand Slam titles. Let's get more reaction from Belgrade. Sasha Osmo is there for us. He's a journalist at Sport Club Serbia. Sasha, great to have you with us on Across the Balkans. Now, what's the view from Serbia to what was happening to Novak in Australia? Uh, thank you for having me, first of all, and uh, uh, reaction to what's been happening with Novak, uh, I would describe it as a mixture of uh, disappointment and anger for most of his fans over here, because uh, uh, after he was granted an exemption and he posted on Instagram that uh, he was going to play the Australian Open, I think many of his fans were relieved because they didn't know if he was going to play. And then when he landed in Melbourne, uh, it all went very south very quickly, and we've seen how the situation has unfolded since then. You know, basically, a few hours we have some new piece of information, and it's been a story that's uh, uh, taken by storm all the all the all the media all over the world, and especially in Serbia. I mean, if you look at the media outlets and. Uh, uh, some of the TV programs have, have even uh, stopped their regular program in order to give their viewers the latest development in the Djokovic story. Right. Also, when the process was ongoing, uh, uh, Serbian public broadcaster was airing it as well as uh, uh, N1, the most prominent cable uh, cable channel. So yes, it's, it's a total frenzy over here. Uh, right, Sasha, Novak's fans must be ecstatic following his clearance from the court. But I've seen also many comments online, uh, Serbian people feeling that the Australian government moves were against the Serbs. But why are they seeing it like this? And how did this issue become so political? I mean, it became political because the government made it political when they rejected Novak and he had all the necessary documentation, when, what, which the which the judge Kelly decided in the end. But uh, as far as the comments on social media and online, I don't think that's a good representative of what people think in any matter in this one as well, because there's a huge majority of people that don't visit social networks, in, that you don't use them that way. So I believe when all of this blows over a little bit, that the people really will realize that Serbia and Australia don't have anything against each other. But at the moment, the tensions are running high, the emotions are running high. So, and with right. this pandemic, everybody's a little bit crazy. And you sometimes you say things you don't mean. But uh, having that being said, I feel the the way Djokovic has been treated since uh, since landing in Melbourne has been has been a shame. You know. Uh, 
you know, eight hours at the airport, isolated the room, three hours without the phone, then five days, three or four days, four or five days, right. I'm not sure, uh, in the detention center. So that's not the way to treat anyone, especially uh, a man who had all the papers with him as it was proven. Right, uh, Sasha, but, but I know uh, I know you're a big uh, Nola fan. I follow you on Twitter. Uh, your Twitter was on fire in the last couple of days. But don't you think he could be more responsible when it comes to the pandemic we are facing? And come out with his vaccination status. I mean, the Balkans already has so many issues with anti-vaxxers and people not trusting officials. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I know that Novak and his brother George, who is recently giving a lot of interviews, of course, in, in light of uh, with the, in light of the situation, uh, they they always say that the medical records are private. I, it's in within their rights to do so. Uh, that being said, I believe with everything what was going on in the in the last couple of days, it would be in Novak's best interest, you know, to to come out uh, with some answers and to explain situation in a way. And I believe. Uh, when his first press conference is due in Melbourne, if he gets to play the Australian Open, after all, that right. there won't be much talk about tennis. There right. won't be many questions uh, about tennis. Exactly. So My we'll next question. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, how will this affect his performance at the uh, Australian Open? Uh, and what if he wins the tournament? What kind of reaction can we expect then? If he wins the tournament, you know, I think that Netflix should just buy the right and make a movie right away if he wins, the, because this is an incredible story. And I mean, Novak has been through all kinds of pressure in his life. He wasn't always a millionaire and the world number one. He lived in poverty, lived through the bombings, like we all have in the 90s. Uh, but uh, and ever since he became professional tennis player, he had his uh, clashes with the media, played against the crowd for many of his big matches. But this is unlike something we've ever seen before, because it's basically whole country so I think it's going to be really, really tough for him mentally to handle and physically as well. He's been five days out of his routine, you know, and uh, uh, stressed out, tired, you know, not being able to uh, to practice, to eat the way he usually eats. And we know how much his diet means to him. And there is another factor as well, even with the ideal conditions, had none of this had happened. I don't think Novak was a clear-cut favorite in Melbourne because you have Alexander Zverev, Daniel Medvedev, who have proven last year that they can beat him in big matches on hard courts. So I think uh, everything that's happened is really has really cut Novak's chances uh, to win the Australian Open. But if anybody can do it, it's him. Right, let's see what happens. But I do agree with you. He, he does need to come out with some kind of explanation because he's such a big star. A lot of, for a lot of people, he's a role model. He needs to clarify this, I think. Anyway, Sasha, thanks so much for being our guest on Thank Across you. the Balkans. Right, let's look at some other stories making headlines in the region this week. Protesters have blocked roads in several Serbian cities demanding the government end a controversial mining project of the Rio Tinto group. The company wants to develop a lithium mine near Loznica city in the west, but environmentalists say it would cause a massive damage. Croatia is imposing new restrictions as the country records its highest number of daily infections since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Public gatherings and sports events have been restricted and there are now extra measures for restaurants and cafes. Authorities are also suggesting people to work from home. And following the holidays, Romania is also imposing stricter pandemic measures amid rising COVID-19 cases that authorities say could overwhelm the country's health system. The restrictions include mandatory masks and health passes and bars and restaurants closing at 10 p.m. Thanks for watching this episode of Across the Balkans. We leave you now with scenes from Istanbul and beyond as Orthodox Christians from across the region celebrated Christmas on January 7th. And if you want to know why they don't celebrate it on December 25th, look up the Julian calendar. Thanks for watching again. See you next time. Bye-bye.